Over recent years, we've seen technology change the way that healthcare is traditionally delivered. Today, technology enables healthcare to be provided from the comfort of a patient's home. The use of data through AI and wearable technology is helping to personalise the way that healthcare is being delivered. My name is Adele Crichton, and I lead Macquarie Business Banking's Healthcare Division. Joining me to discuss how technology is revolutionising health, the healthcare industry, personalising the patient experience, and providing increased access to services and treatments is Dr. Sylvia Pfeiffer, the co-founder and CEO of Kobu, Mike Harmon, the co-founder and CEO of VisionFlex, Dr. Sean Parsons, the founder, CEO, and managing director of Alum, and Bill Maiden, the CEO of My Emergency Doctor. Welcome to you all, and thank you so much for joining us today. Sylvia, let's start with you. How do you see the trend of digitization disrupting healthcare, and how do you think that the industry is actually adapting to this change? So um, let's start uh, by rolling back to 2019 prior to the pandemic. Uh, when you would talk to the person on the street about telehealth, uh, they'd look at you queer and wouldn't really know what that means. Really the only people who understood anything about telehealth were the people in rural and remote areas. Uh, but rolling forwards through the pandemic, we've seen a big change happening during the pandemic. And uh, the general population is much more uh, aware now of what, uh, what, what telehealth means, uh, that there are video technologies through which they can see their clinicians, um, and, and that there is a much easier way to deal with healthcare than before. Uh, we've done a, a consumer uh, report <coughs> where we asked about a, <coughs> a thousand Australians uh, about their experience with healthcare and what they would like to see. And 70% actually said they would like to see their clinicians, their GPs via video telehealth. But 40%, over 40% said that GPs didn't offer it. So that's a really big difference. Um, and it's something that, uh, that we need to change in our industry. It's a change we need to make. Yeah, and, and my VisionFlex manufactures the technology that connects remote patients to healthcare anywhere in the world. Can you talk to us about a couple of examples of where technology is really uh, decentralising the needs of patients' various needs? Well, Adele, um, it, with an engineering background, um, when we started uh, VisionFlex, it was sort of natural for us to move into the device space. Um, and so we created a range of uh, all-in-one medical devices to, uh, to act as a telehealth hub or a telehealth portal to connect people through to remote services. And because that device um, is a standalone medically certified device, it's the uptake of that has been uh, terrific to see. You know, over the last few years, we now have installations um, of the telehealth hub, the ProEx, into uh, all of the Antarctic stations with the Australian Antarctic Division. The Royal Flying Doctors are a, a huge uh, customer of ours now with uh, devices being deployed uh, all around the country into some really remote locations. Uh, we, we sell these devices through to ExxonMobil for use in oil rigs, Justice Health going out into the prisons. So most of our business is what we would call corporate telehealth. Uh, the corporate telehealth has not really had the uptake of telehealth as the consumer market has had throughout the COVID uh, time. Uh, corporate telehealth has been growing steadily uh, over the years. We've been doing this for a number of years now. Um, and, uh, and most of our installations are in situations where we have a nurse or a health practitioner on site with the patient um, and uh, they're connecting through to a specialist or GP services at a remote location. Uh, and we've had some really interesting ones recently. Um, we deployed uh, a bunch of units to the Royal Flying Doctors in South Australia and I had assumed uh, that they would be going out into remote communities uh, around South Australia. But uh, uh, the guys at the Royal Flying Doctors told me that um, about half of the units are actually going into truck stops. Um, and also into cattle stations. Uh, and you can imagine cattle stations, they, uh, you know, they have uh, injuries and they have uh, workplace issues that they need to deal with, health issues are very remote. Um, and truck stops, apparently um, there are a lot of uh, grey nomads uh, 
being uh, serviced by telehealth um, at these truck stops across the Nullarbor and at various places in Australia. And we now have a, uh, an unattended access mode where, uh, where the wife or the husband can actually contact the doctor in Broken Hill remotely um, and, uh, and they can then consult and give them guidance on how to uh, treat the customer or the patient. So, uh, you know, there's some really interesting applications um, in the corporate side of telehealth as compared to the consumer side of telehealth. I think that's so interesting because like typically when we're thinking about telehealth, you, you, as I said at the start, like you're thinking about in the comfort of the, the patient's home, but actually extending that, you've really stretched our thinking around um, where else can this apply, Antarctica, oil rigs, um, truck stops, et cetera, and, and therefore the, the benefit is exponential. Um, Bill, you've spoken about technology being able to completely um, uh, di will offer a completely different way of delivering care, rather than just looking at that like, small iterations to the way that we've always done things. Um, you, you said you talk about the need to actually change people's beliefs in how healthcare can be delivered and what can be done. Can you just talk to us about how you see this playing out in your space? Sure, Adele. Um, we've just spoken about a number of different care settings for where telehealth is being, being applied. For our business, My Emergency Doctor, we're actually providing care into the hospital system. And, it, and it's interesting how we've seen the uptake of telehealth being so pronounced in the last 12 months with the, with the onset of the pandemic. But some of our hospitals have, have been somewhat slow to be able to sort of cha challenge what the way that they actually provide care. So in the terms of our business, what we do at My Emergency Doctor is that we provide access to emergency specialists. So these are the doctors the, that run the emergency departments that you might find in Royal Prince Alfred or in Royal Melbourne. Um, these, are the, these are the doctors that are generally running the department. Now, what we do is that we provide access to those doctors through voice and video. We are the provider of the doctor itself. Um, what we do is we actually provide access to those doctors in places and times where that access is most challenging. Now, whereas this, and Sylvia mentioned this before, um, these are often in regional and rural locations in Australia, but increasingly they are being in outer metropolitan um, emergency departments where demand is frequently exceeding capacity. Now, one of the key challenges that we actually face is, is this something that you can really even do in terms of being able to provide telehealth into the emergency department setting? Even when I learned about our business, I even had came with my own biases. Is it really even possible for an emergency department doctor to provide care through to a patient without physically being there? Well, I guess it really depends on, on how you see that care is actually being delivered. Now, when we look at the emergency department setting, we can't do things in a physical environment such as cannulating or um, intubating a patient. That's not the problem we're solving. We're solving a problem around providing access to expertise. So when you think about my doctors, what they are is they are the senior clinical decision makers within an emergency department. What you want them to do is make decisions. You wanna be able to provide them with access to information so that those decisions can be both timely and most importantly, that those decisions can be of excellent clinical judgment. And so that's what we're doing. We're actually providing a way to deliver that expertise into that environment. And we do that by working with clinicians not to do the cannulation or the intubation, but to help them make those important life-saving decisions that are being made all the time. And that's what we're actually able to do is to provide that expertise into that environment. The other key belief that we're challenging is whether or not you need to have a doctor there all the time. And if you think about a regional or rural setting, um, take for example, a regional hospital in Western New South Wales, there might be 10 patients who might present between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. on one day, and the next day there might be zero. Yet the hospital is required or would seek to provide an emergency specialist for an entire 10 hour shift. Now, frankly, that's just not sustain sustainable and not a great use of resources. What we're able to do with telehealth now is we're able to fractionate the delivery of expertise as and when it's needed and never when it's not. And so the notion of whether or not I can get access to a specialist is now no longer binary. You're either gonna get one or you're not. And most often it's you're not. Now what we're able to do in challenging this key belief system is we're able to say, I can match the demand for my expertise when it occurs with the capacity for it. That's brilliant. So, so good. Um, and Sean, turning to you, we're seeing patients take a greater interest in their health using wearable devices that can track everything from sleep, heart rate, exercise. How is technology supporting the transfer of biological information 
into digital information that's then easily digestible by a physician that can treat. Yeah, thanks Adele. The, um, as part of the consumer healthcare revolution, which, which we feel is really underway, there's a huge focus on gathering data from those people to help clinicians make good decisions. A little bit the kinds of information which a clinician might need to make decisions should they be in the clinic or an emergency department. Uh, in some cases, that is um, an ECG, um, where knowing someone's heart rhythm and some specifics about, um, about their, their heart profile enables better decision making. In other cases, it's you know, temperature, breathing rates, barometry, uh, all of these things are, are important pieces of information that can be better used or enable better decision making by clinicians that are located remotely. A little bit like um, you know replacing that information gathering of examination that would typically happen in a uh, the clinical scenario. For Loom, we focus on common infectious diseases and bringing a biological diagnosis or rapid test for the four common illnesses, with the goal of being able to provide that piece of biological information in a digital format to a remotely located clinician. So um, we developed a home uh, flu test over many years and we were the first company to create a home COVID test to be authorised by the FDA. And, and what that really does is enable someone to, to diagnose themselves remotely and then to connect in with optimal care. And our perspective on the world is that, you know, these, these data capturing uh, modalities, whether it be for common infectious diseases or heart rhythm or uh, breath sounds, there's some terrific companies around doing, doing great work on understanding people's breath sounds as they cough to give an indication of lower respiratory infections, are really, are really providing those, um, that information that enables remotely located clinicians to make robust decisions. And we certainly think that's a, big part of the trajectory of healthcare moving forward. Excellent. And, and, and Mike, there's been a lot of discussion regarding then integrating device data with electronic health records over time. How do you actually see this supporting the interoperability in, in healthcare? The, um, <clears throat> the integration of any device in a, uh, in a healthcare setting is, uh, is really essential. I mean, the uh, health professionals, doctors, nurses, are so busy that they really don't have time to work with um, standalone pieces of equipment. Everything needs to be integrated. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time uh, making sure that happens. So our ProEX telehealth hub, uh, which is the sort of the keystone device of VisionFlex, where we connect all of our peripheral devices to, um, everything is integrated into that device. So we have uh, video conferencing integrated into the device, so you can make a video call directly from the device to uh, anybody, uh, a specialist, GP, uh, nationally, internationally. Um, we also have um, software inside uh, which integrates the built-in database with the hospital database. So any records, um, ECG traces, blood pressure, pulse oximetry, anything uh, which is captured on our device is automatically uh, pushed through uh, to the electronic health record system and available uh, in the patient record. Um, and we also have uh, scheduling systems for our video conferencing platform so that uh, these appointments, uh, when they come up, can be very easily um, added uh, and, uh, and, uh, and synchronized with the calendar system of the, of the clinic or the hospital. So integration is key uh, and workflow uh, is key in any hospital or in any clinical environment. And uh, you know, I think if the device is not uh, correctly integrated with that workflow, you'll find that it just won't be used or that the uptake won't be there. So uh, it's really important uh, uh, aspect of the device. It's not just about the device itself, it's about how it fits into the workflow and how it fits into the, uh, the daily work routine of the health professionals. And, and, and everyone could be feeding that data into the electronic health record over time. Like how does that actually change the, the patient experience in your eyes? Well, it means that the patient can, I mean, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, face -face doctor consults are not, um, we're not replacing those with telehealth. So you find that a lot of the consultations for a patient, perhaps post-operative post examinations or checkups might be done via telehealth. Um, and then uh, from time to time, the patient will still go to see uh, the doctor or the specialist face-to-face. -face. Um, and if that information is, is automatically uploaded from our device, during those telehealth consultations, then when the patient does go 
uh, to visit the specialist, all of that information is going to be at hand. The specialist has got all the results from previous examinations um, uh, there in front of him in the electronic health record system. Uh, and it just makes the whole experience a lot more um, seamless, I guess is the word, uh, for the patient and also for the health professionals. Um, it's all about capturing data, storing it in the right place, uh, and obviously making sure that it's secure and that we ensure patient privacy at the same time. Yeah, and it, it makes sense that like, taking that pressure off the patient and the caregiver so they don't have to remember, repeat, um, oh, yeah. moving from, from specialist to specialist. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so definitely way of the future. Uh, Bill, we are seeing an increase in m and activity in the healthcare industry, um, a lot where uh, really technology is incorporated with a traditional healthcare business where continued care can be offered rather than um, simply the episodic care. How do, you really, how, how do you see this playing out in the healthcare industry? Sure, Adele. Well, when I, when I think about sort of the, those two care settings between continued care and, and episodic care, I think about sort of what are the, what's the common thread or the, the few common threads that might exist between those two settings. For me, it's the consumer and the clinician. I'll speak to the consumer first. I think when we think about a consumer being able to navigate between those two settings and, and arguably between different types of care providers within those two settings, it's a pretty fragmented journey. And I think it's very far from being consumer centric in terms of how we operate collectively as a system right now. It hasn't really been designed other than to deliver really good quality care. I think the overall experience that a, a consumer ex, um, actually encounters when they move between these settings is, is far from satisfactory. Um, so, so really, you know, what, what, what does that look like if you thought about that in terms of other industries? If, that was, if this was banking as an example, what it looks like in moving between settings is it is almost as if every financial institution is providing its own product, just one product, and that those products are being managed by an individual relationship manager who is not actually connected to any of those products themselves. That's what it looks like for a consumer to navigate the health system largely with only the support of a GP. No one can really support them other than that particular provider through that setting. So I think that creates a lot of opportunities for, for, for the system as a whole and care providers around how do we make that overall journey more seamless and more integrated? We're, we're starting to make good progress on the data front, but I think there's so much more that can be done in connecting different providers, how they see the consumer and moving them through the system so that we get a better outcome for consumers and also an overall better outcome for the system. Now, my view is that the Australian market is far too fragmented and no one player is, is sufficiently big enough to be able to own the rails to provide a consistent and coherent experience for consumers. Um, but that, that therefore requires a more of an open solution where care providers are going to be able to collaborate to, to deliver that seamless and consistent experience. On the other side of things, we've got the con clinician experience. Uh, largely in so much of what we hear about healthcare is that the clinician is the constrained resource. And therefore, the importance of the clinician to be able to deliver um, a high quality, effective service is really going to be quite important. For healthcare providers to be successful, I think we need to find ways to be get better at providing a better experience for our clinicians. So what does that mean? I think that means giving them the best tools possible to be able to deliver the highest quality care. A lot of my fellow panelists here are very much about doing that. It's also about providing attractive and compelling remuneration. And I think it's also about providing continued development opportunities so that we can continue to get better and connect well, particularly where we're seeing more and more instances of remote care delivery. So at, at, in my business, we're very focused in providing the most compelling employment proposition for doctors. At the end of the day, our business is about providing access to those doctors. If I create the place that only our doctors want to work, then we will be successful and we will win. And I think that applies to most care providers. Yeah, and, and really interesting that um, you talk about physician experience because uh, you know a lot of the discussions yes. are about looking at that patient experience and, and really mapping out that journey and looking at how to make it uh, smoother and more um, uh, effective to get better outcomes. But if we think about the quadruple aim of healthcare, incorporating that physician experience as one of the as one of the quadrants, um, extremely important. Um, so, Sean. Moving, moving to you and um, looking at how Illum launched America's first COVID-19 test, um, test for consumers. Can you talk to us about a couple of the trends that you're seeing globally and what that experience was like um, launching that in America? Uh, the macro, uh, the trends, macro uh, trends are consumerisation of healthcare, which I think we've, we've touched, touched on a few, on a few times, times um, in this discussion. discussion. 
um, the um, digitization of healthcare. Of healthcare. So, so it's, it's more and more, more digital, 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 which is a very much a key theme. And then, you know, thirdly, the decentralization of moving further and further out of the the, uh, the clinic and the hospital into the hands of consumers. So that, that what we see is the macro forces driving healthcare, and we think that's going to continue. Uh, launching the product in the US has been obviously a big, uh, exciting endeavor, uh, taking a first in category product through the pharmacy channels into consumers' hands in the US through CVS and Amazon and so on and so forth. Um, those, that is a relatively well-trodden path from a commercial perspective. Uh, the, the more challenging thing is working that through then with consumers and, and educating them about why, this, why our product is superior and benefits that that brings. So, um, so yeah, it's been a terrific journey. Excellent. Um, and, and Silvia, really, the, the impact of COVID-19 has brought about many new challenges, uh, but also quite a few opportunities. We'd love to hear from you about where you see the future of healthcare. Um, I'll start with the telehealth uh, area, of course, that, that we work in. Uh, we've seen a huge change uh, in the last year. Uh, telehealth has become uh, a, a, a Medicare item that the government is supporting uh, re via reimbursement. Now that's two areas, that's the telephone, which is obviously a 150 year old technology, which is finally being reimbursed for, for providing a, uh, a channel to uh, access to care. Uh, but there's also video consultations, which is uh, where my company, CoView, has been uh, making the most impact. Wrap on the uh, so over uh, the year of 2020, we've uh, provided over 3 million video consultations to patients. Uh, and that's um, patients that were looking for mental health consultations, speech therapy, uh, physical Finish therapy, one, yeah. uh, dietetics. Uh, it's also been going into um, hospitals. Uh, outpatient clinics, um, let's say post-cancer care, uh, and, and lots of other application areas as, as well as uh, GP practices. So uh, I think that uh, the approach that we've taken with bringing video telehealth into the hands of the consumers is a first step in the digital transformation of healthcare. Uh, there's many other things happening, and Sean particularly has uh, talked about uh, the uh, the devices that go into the people's homes. Um, uh, Mike here does does the same thing. Uh, with with different types of devices that are very important to measure uh, the uh, the health of of the patients, um, and uh, bringing that together will be the future of healthcare. We will need to have a lot more remote patient monitoring devices. It could be mobile applications uh, and many other things. So I think we will see a lot of changes happening over the next uh, couple of years. Also from the way that uh, we get reimbursed. Think, for example, about uh, a mobile application that tracks your health that can get reimbursed by the government, uh, just like a um, like a pharmaceutical gets gets reimbursed right now. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and final final question um, that we've got time for, and, and Sean, it's for you because I know that you've talked about um, growing up as a digital company. And uh, I'd love to know then how you think this has affected the lens that you've looked at um, technology in healthcare. Certainly, and I think all, all four of the businesses as part of this panel have really come at this from a digital lens to begin with and, and are really digital natives, if you like. Uh, and that's, that's very important because the, the digital bit for us, like it is for others, is not a bolt-on. It's, sort of, it's not a way of trying to, you know, to add a little bit of extra value on the edge, it's really fundamental and core to the service which we provide and deliver. And more and more as these, um, these technologies um, help healthcare get more accessible and affordable, uh, in many cases effective, um, that's how we're going to, as a community, tackle the challenges of, um, of healthcare, which we, which we know are very much ahead, but being able to offer affordable healthcare as a whole for, for our community without compromising on the quality through that journey. So digital is undoubtedly part of that solution. And um, you know, all, all four businesses today are about finding that and finding places to, to deliver that in different ways. So um, it's certainly terrific to be a part of the group. Thank you. And, and yes, you're right. Everyone has definitely spoken about all the quality of care and not disrupting that in any way. So thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate um, your input into the conversation. And it's, it's an exciting time. 
um, how technology is is changing healthcare and how um, what impact you all are having in that. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Thanks all. Pleasure.